This video is the third in a short series on the mathematics of waves, and this time the main goal is to find the dependence of velocity on tension and linear density. So our approach here is to perform a force analysis on a small mass increment on a string, and then apply Newton's second law in order to arrive at a partial differential equation governing the wave function y of x and t for waves in one dimension. So we're going to arrive at the one-dimensional wave equation, and comparing to our last encounter with the wave equation in the previous video, we're able to arrive at an expression for wave velocity in terms of tension and linear density. So that's the plan, and in the animation, we're viewing the wave function, that's a cosine kt minus omega t, and we see a highlighted little chunk of the string oscillating as a sinusoidal wave passes through. The acceleration is shown as a white vector as the mass oscillates, and we see that the acceleration is upward when the mass is below equilibrium and downward when the mass is above equilibrium. Now to get the wave equation, the idea is to relate the curvature of the string, in other words the second x derivative of the wave function, to the acceleration of this little mass increment, in other words the second time derivative of the wave function. And we begin this time very fundamentally with a force analysis on this little chunk. And we're just going to zoom in on this guy to get a better look. And we're going to call that little chunk of the string dm. That's an increment of mass, so an infinitesimal little chunk of mass. And it happens to be accelerating upwards, so we have our upward acceleration in the diagram as well. Next, we label the left and right ends of that little interval that dm lives on. So the left end of it we're going to call x, just some arbitrary point along the string, and the right end is x plus dx, so just an infinitesimal step to the right. Next, we have to get force vectors into the diagram. So we have the tension in the string pulling down and to the left on the left end of dm, and up and to the right on the right end of dm. Now by the end of this derivation, we're going to use the fact that the tension is the same everywhere in the string, but for now it's useful to distinguish between that left pointing tension and the right pointing tension, calling them 1 and 2 respectively. So it's important to note that the string is steeper on the right than it is on the left because we're in a region of upward concavity, and because the tension pulls tangential to the string, T2 is going to be steeper than T1. Next, we break T1 and T2 into their horizontal and vertical components in the usual way, and we label those T1x, T1y t2x and t2y, and now we can start doing some physics. So the first thing we want to do is use the fact that our acceleration is purely vertical to conclude that those two x components are exactly balancing each other. So t1x has to be equal to t2x in magnitude. This allows us to express those x components with a new symbol that's common to both of the tension vectors, and we're going to call that horizontal component th and just replace that in the diagram. Now it's critically important in this derivation to make a couple tricky approximations, and each one of these is based on the assumption that the amplitude of oscillations is very small. In other words, the string is very close to flat. So just visualize a guitar string, for example, you can barely see it vibrating, even though you know there are waves bouncing back and forth on the string. So if we make this small amplitude assumption, we can conclude that the horizontal component of tension is approximately equal to the tension itself. So really what we're saying here is the horizontal leg of the right triangle is approximately equal to the length of the hypotenuse because the vertical leg is so incredibly small by comparison. So we can say that th is approximately equal to t1 or t2, or by the end of the derivation, we'll just go ahead and call it t, the tension in the string. Our second small amplitude approximation is that the mass of our small chunk, dm, can be computed by taking the linear density mu and multiplying just by dx. Now recall that linear density is the mass per unit length, so if you multiply it by length, you get the mass. What we're saying here is that the length of dm is approximately just equal to dx, the horizontal displacement across that mass increment. In other words, the string is so flat that dm is nearly horizontal at all times, so its length is well approximated by dx. So as we go on with the derivation, I'll try to clearly point out where these two approximations are being used. So now we can move along to doing the force analysis and applying Newton's second law to this little mass increment dm. So Newton's second law says that the net force in the y direction is equal to the mass times the y acceleration. 
And again, we're talking about the forces acting on our little mass dm here. So we're going to replace m with dm. And what's the net force in the y direction? Well, that's just t2y pointing up and then minus t1y, which is our downward pointing component. Note that t2y is a larger component because t2 is steeper than t1. And again, this was caused by the upward concavity of the string. So this is how we get a net upward force on dm and therefore a positive vertical acceleration at the moment that we see in the picture. In this step, we've also replaced m with dm. And now recall that our goal is to relate the curvature of the string to the second time derivative of the wave function. So we want to somehow relate those tension y components to the slope of the string. And we know again that the direction of the tension vectors is the same as the slope of the string. In other words, they act tangentially. And the slope of the tension vectors is simply related to their components. We can make this more clear by rearranging the y components. And now we see that the slope of the string at the left end is just given by rise over run there, which is t1y divided by th. And so we write this as dy dx evaluated at x, which is the left end point for our mass increment. And this allows us to replace t1y with th times the derivative at the left end of the increment. So t1y is th times dy dx evaluated at x. Now we do a similar thing for t2y. So again, this says the slope at the right end of the mass increment, so that's an x value of x plus dx, is equal to t2y divided by th, that's just the rise over run, and we solve for t2y and find that we can replace it with th times the slope at the right end of the mass increment. So we're going to make these replacements back into Newton's second law, and at the same time, we're going to replace dm with mu dx. So this is where we're using one of our small amplitude approximations. dm is approximately mu dx. And the final replacement we're gonna make in this next step is to replace the y acceleration with the second time derivative of the wave function. Okay, so on the left-hand side, we have th times the slope of our wave function evaluated at the right end of our mass increment, minus th times the slope of our function evaluated at the left end of our mass increment, is equal to mu dx, remember that used to be dm, times d squared y dt squared, which is the y acceleration of dm. Now at this point, we're starting to see something very familiar on the left-hand side. This is a function evaluated at x plus dx minus the same function evaluated at x. This is starting to look a heck of a lot like the definition of a derivative. That's a vertical change in a function and the horizontal change. So we're going to divide both sides by dx and we'll divide by th to get that over to the right hand side as well. And the additional thing I've done in this step is to just replace th, that's the magnitude of the horizontal component of the tension, with just a t. And this is the second small amplitude approximation. Remember that the horizontal component of tension is approximately equal to the tension itself if the amplitude is small. So now on the left-hand side, we have this function dy dx evaluated at x plus dx. That's the right end of the interval. Minus the same function evaluated at the left end of the interval. And then divided by the width of the interval. Now because dx is infinitesimal, the limit is implied here. We're taking the small increment limit of the vertical change of a function divided by the horizontal change. That is the derivative of that function. In other words, the derivative of the first derivative of the wave function. So on the left-hand side, we end up with the second derivative of y with respect to x. On the right-hand side, we're left with a mu over t, and then the second derivative of y with respect to t, which again was the acceleration. And this is the big payoff of all this force analysis. We just got the one-dimensional wave equation by using Newton's second law. Now, if we compare to the previous video, in that video, we found the wave equation by studying the mathematical form of a moving wave and that coefficient is 1 over v squared, where v is the wave speed. This means that 1 over v squared must be the same thing as mu over t. And we can go ahead and solve for v. And we get that v is the square root of t over mu. So we've accomplished the main mission of this video, which was to express the wave velocity in terms of the tension and linear density of the string. We just take the tension, divide by the linear density, and square root the result. And this predicts the speed at which waves will propagate on that string. If you enjoyed this video or at least found it useful, check out another one by clicking one of the links on the left. 
or click the Zach's Lab logo on the right to explore dozens of physics and math playlists. As always, you can leave your questions, comments, and requests in the comments section below, and I'll get back to you within 24 hours. Thanks for watching Zach's Lab, and best of luck on your math and physics journey.